right, let's see. That looks like pretty good input there. Now, because I'm, here's a very important tip, because I'm going to be syncing the audio from here together with the video, uh, it makes it easy if I have a clear moment where um, I can see where the sound spikes and a loud thing should be happening. Y'all watch those movies where, uh, uh, ever seen shows where they're talking about making movies and the guy comes in with that thing they call a clapper and says, sudden, sudden, such, such, take one, pow. That's what that's for. That pow allows them to sync, uh, to have a good spot where they can sync up the audio. Because if they sync it there, it makes sense that it's synced everywhere else, right? And so your mouth doesn't look like one of those old Japanese movies, you know. Uh, with <laughs> so what I do is I do this. Now I can go to the video and find where I did that and find in the sound where it goes whoop and make sure it matches up just right. And boom, there it is. All right. I think... We are ready to go. Are y'all seeing this box disappear? Y'all are following me, right? Got a, a picture up on the screen? Okay. That's, that's almost our whole family. I'm Tommy Alderman uh, from Brookhaven, Mississippi of Alderman Farms. Grew up in Baker, Louisiana. That's almost our whole family. We're missing our oldest daughter, Chelsea, uh, who was a cheerleader here a few years ago, and my son-in-law, Chicho, his real name is Guillermo. He played tennis here a little while uh, ago. And, uh, and my grandson, Tomas, who's our favorite farm member. Um, but that's most of us. And um, my wife and I both grew up in Baker, Louisiana. Uh, my, my folks are from here. Uh, they, they were born outside of Lincoln. They're both deceased now uh, within the last few years. But my father moved down just outside of Baton Rouge to go to work for Exxon Refinery because back in those days, um, my dad was, I was a, a late, late baby. So they, you know, my dad was pretty old. Um, he was post-World War II is when they went down there and um, uh, to find work. And so in growing up, we didn't spend a lot of time up here. Um, because both my mom and dad were depression area kids, and so frankly, they didn't have a whole lot of fond memories uh, of being up here. Um, but so I'll, I'll get in a minute to how we ended up here uh, in in Mississippi. I'm so thankful that that we did uh, in Louisiana. Now I got to figure out how to get rid of this because it's looking. There we go. I had. Uh, I spent 20 years in law enforcement. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's not me. Let's see if I can find me. There I am. I'm the one in the middle. I spent 20 years in law enforcement, most of which at the Baker Police Department in our hometown. And growing up, which was a lot like Mayberry. And uh, we lived on... Uh, we started out, you know, I, I, back in that day, to tell you that we would be farming the property in Mississippi, I would have thought you would have lost your mind. There, there was no way uh, that, that that would ever happen. I just didn't have any interest in it. I have a degree in English, uh, which means I wrote really, really good police reports. <laughs> uh, and it's true. I never lost a court case in, in my entire uh, career. And uh, sometimes my supervisors didn't like them because they were a little bit longer than uh, Saul Burglar arrested same, you know. But, uh, but I did have a successful career in law enforcement, and I really thought I would spend my entire life in law enforcement and then do some training and whatnot. I've always enjoyed training, and um, I was a training officer in public speaking and, and, and so forth. But anyway... So we lived in um, a small neighborhood, my wife and I, when we first started out uh, with a tiny little subdivision yard, and I don't think we did any gardening while we were there. Um, and our second little step-up house was a little bit bigger yard, and we did do a little bit of gardening there, but nothing, again, to indicate that we would be um, have what we have under hoe now. Um, at, uh, at Alderman Farms. And then our third residence, we, we moved kind of just near the city limits uh, in, in Baker, and we had two and a half acres. 
And we lived, let me, let me, I want to show you somebody that we lived next door to. This man right here, right down the road from Mr. Thomas Carl Stump Easley, the, the man in the top picture. He's deceased now as well. And uh, he was an old timer that, that knew some stuff. And he took us under, our wing, under his wing, really took Patty, uh, my wife, under, under, took a liking to her because she didn't mind getting dirt under her fingernails. You know, she didn't mind getting out and, and working and uh, doing what was necessary. And he taught us so, so much. Well, along about that time, which was in the late 90s, uh, uh, mid to late 90s, uh, milk reached $4 a gallon. Uh, down where we were in Baker, Louisiana. And Patty said, I'm not paying $4 a gallon for what they call milk in the grocery store. If we're going to pay $4 a gallon for milk, then we're going to have milk that's worth paying $4 for, so we're going to get us some goats and make our own milk. And we knew it wouldn't necessarily be cheaper because we would have the cost of the feed and whatnot, but again, it would be a matter of quality. And so I agreed, and we said, okay, let's go find us a goat. And I said, I'm sorry, before I said that, I said, before we do that, i got to taste it. I don't know what goat milk tastes like. When I was a little bitty baby, I was raised on goat milk. Some of you may have been, and you may not know it, because a lot of babies end up being raised on goat milk because they, for some reason they can't take the formula or any, in, anyway. So we made uh, the... Uh, what I found out later was a violation of cardinal rule number one. If you want to taste goat milk, do not go to the grocery store. And that's what we did. We went to the grocery store and we bought a quart of goat milk and brought it home and poured it in a glass. And frankly, I thought it looked a little funny. And when I put it in my mouth, it never made it to my throat. It tasted so bad that I spit it all over the place. It was awful. And I told Patty, that's the end of that. You know, uh, take money out of my allowance to buy milk if you have to, but no thank you. And she said the same thing. It was horrible. So that was really, could have been the end of it. But a few weeks later, she was, we homeschooled, had, had been homeschooling by that time. And a few weeks later, she was visiting with another, with a friend of hers who was also homeschooling. And um, I'm not sure if we knew that they had goats or not, but they did. And she relayed, Patty relayed that story to her, and she was like, girl, no, come here, and brought her in the kitchen and poured her a glass of, of cold milk, you know, that had been milked recently out of a goat, and Patty called me, and she said, Tommy, it's, it's wonderful, uh, we, we, we have to try again, and I was like, okay, you know, we'll try again, you know, I, I trust you, I trust this woman, she had no reason to sneak store-bought milk in and try to trick her, you know, because she wasn't selling a goat, and... Um, so we started looking again, and we, we found a goat for sale about 20 miles from where we lived, and we went out there, and it was an old gentleman, and he had quite a number of goats, and uh, we didn't know a whole lot, but it turns out it was a good goat. Um, uh, we had her for many, many years, but so we decided we wanted her, and I told the old gentleman, I said, sir, before I buy this goat, I've got to taste this milk, because <laughs> I still had that bad thought in my head. He said, I'll be right back, and he walked in the house, and he came back out a minute later with some water, some stuff he could clean her udder with, and, and he, he brought a jar, and he bought a little glass, and he got down, and he cleaned her, and he squirted some of that milk away, and he squirted some in that jug, and then he held that glass on there and squirted it about half full of milk, and he handed it to me, but as he reached it out to me, he pulled it, and he got it almost to me, and he pulled it back, and he said, I got to warn you about something, and I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> I figured he was going to say, it's an acquired taste. You ever had anybody tell you that? Remember that? You know, you have to get used to it. I thought he was, what he told me was, he said, it's going to make you want to throw rocks at cows. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> and look, he handed me that, and I smelled it, and it smelled okay. And I took a little sip, and I took a little more, and I, took, and I thought, oh, my word, that is heavenly. It tasted almost vanilla. It almost like had a little bit of almond extract in it or something. It was absolutely delicious. And I said, sold, load her up, let's go. So we brought our first goat home. And then the next funny part of that is we got her out there, boy, and we started milking. And at that time, we were really nervous about 
cleanliness and we pasteur we bought a pasteurizer and we pasteurized the milk and we would go out and we would milk and almost come running in the house and have ice in the sink and sit the milk down in the ice for it to cool down real fast. And uh, now we don't do any of that. We don't, we don't pasteurize our milk unless we're, unless we're selling a little goat milk to somebody and they want us to um, because we, we've learned that in a small herd like ours, if your animals are healthy and you kept them clean and all, you don't have to worry about anything. So, but we, during this process, we would, you know, chill the milk real fast and pasteurize it and chill it again and put it in the fridge and take it out and drink it. And I'd say, you know, that's good, but it don't taste nothing like it did at that man's house. I mean, it's good, nothing wrong with it, but, I, but that vanilla was gone. That, that I, I thought, did that old man squirt something in that, jo- in that glass? What did I miss? So I said, well, maybe it's her feed. And we started monkeying with her feed, and um, we bought black oil sunflower seeds, and we bought all kinds of stuff to increase the butter fat uh, in her milk, and it just never would get sweet again like that. And I was, I was just bummed out because it was, I'm telling you, that milk was awesome. And then one day, I don't know why I did it because I didn't think about it. It wasn't that I remembered what he did, but for some reason I took a glass out to the barn with me and at some point during milking her, I squirted some in that glass and tasted it, and there it was. And so I found that what, what was happening was the chilling was removing, it was knocking that sweet edge off of it. And uh, I, I don't know why, but so still to this day, every, we, well, not today, we don't have any goats in milk right now, but I will occasionally take me a glass out to the barn when we're <laughs> milking the goats to have a little bit of, of warm goat milk. So that's how it started. And uh, Patty's going to watch this and she's going to say, no, we got chickens first. I don't remember whether we got chickens first or not, but then we got chickens. Or we had chickens and then we got goats, one or the other. We got chickens and goats sometime in there. You know, chickens are universally known as a gateway drug. Uh, there's a great, I, I encourage you to Google chickens as a gateway drug, and I hope you can find it. There's a video out there of this lady uh, who is just as serious as she can be talking about how chickens were a, gate, were a gateway drug for her, and it sounds just like she's talking about crack, and uh, you know, but she's talking about goats and how it led her into all these other things, and, and it's hilarious. She pulls it off very, very well. Um, so we had... A couple of Muscovy ducks. We had, uh, we added one or two goats. We had, I don't know, a, a dozen or two chickens. And my wife loved to camp. And that's kind of a weird transition, but it's important. It gets us to where we are. And her, my wife's dad passed away when she was small. She was eight years old. And some of the few outstanding memories she has with her dad is when he would take her camping. And they would like to go camping to clear, at Clear Springs out on uh, Highway 84 toward Roxy. Who knows where Clear Springs is? Anybody? Anybody know where Clear Springs is? They would go, my dad, by the way, helped build that place years before World War II. Uh, dra- they drug logs out of that lake up over that hill on the other side with mules. <laughs> but Patty's dad would take them camping to Clear Springs. And so um, after we were married and... Uh, we Patty wanted to start camping, so we would go to Clear Springs a few times. I think my oldest son, Cameron, who was the bearded guy on the other end of that first picture we looked at, uh, he was a little bitty. He was a year old, and uh, that was a tough car ride for him. But we camped several times. I don't remember how many. And and then suddenly one day I said, you know, Patty, we've got some property not far from here. You want to go look at it? Because, again, remember I said earlier, as a child, we didn't spend very much time on the family place because my parents didn't have very good memories of it. And she said, sure. I had come up here a couple of times as a teenager, squirrel hunting, things like that. But she said, sure, let's go. So we went. She loved it. And so we immediately started clearing out a little spot that we could put a little tent or something and and do our camping on our, on our property instead. That led to uh, going back in the woods, finding the place in the woods where the original old house was where my dad was born. 
Um, the house burned down when he was about 10 years old, but, but there were things there that we all just knew where it was. So we decided to build a camp that we could come camp in, a structure, like a 12 by 16 building. And so we did that. And we didn't get it quite completely finished, but it was enough that we could stay in it. And we decided we would come stay one Easter break. Um, and that would have been 1998, I guess, Easter. And 98 or 99, I think 98. And we spent the whole Easter break. I took vacation and we stayed out in the woods. Well, we didn't stay in the woods. We came into Brookhaven and, you know, shopped and did some things. And um, something happened to me during that week. And when we got back to Baker and pulled in our driveway, I told Patty, I said, we're moving. We're going to Mississippi. And she was like, okay, you know. And so um, that's a shortened version of events. But in August of 2000, um, I, here I was a cop and didn't have much, you know, had no idea what I'd do when I got up here. But the sheriff at the time in Lincoln County was gracious enough to hire me. And so in August of 2000, I became a Lincoln County Sheriff's deputy and we were able to move. Uh, we've got 116 acres of land that nobody ever bought. It was in, uh, granted to my great-great-grandfather in a land grant sometime in the, in the 1800s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. You mean it was a legacy? That was our vocabulary word. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's uh, and my my 116 uh, is is connected to you know 300 and some odd other acres that belong to my cousins. You know, so it's not like 116 out in the middle of nowhere. It's 116 out of 100 and well, actually, my great great grandfather had a whole section of land. Who knows how many acres is in a section? 640. 640 acres is a section. Uh, of land. I think it's a square mile, if I'm not mistaken about that. Um, so there we were, and we, we brought our chickens. <laughs> we brought our goats. In fact, the first building we had on our property was a shed for the goats. Um, before we even had a home, we had a shed for the goats. And um, so, but we didn't move up here with any idea that we would be doing anything other than me being in law enforcement and us raising our little stuff for us, you know. Um, but as, as time went on, a couple of things happened. Um, one thing was YouTube. Not that, you know, we, back in, in March of 20, I had a YouTube channel. There was a time in my life where I was a little bit skinnier than this. I lost like 80 pounds. Well, I was also heavier than this. I weighed 230, and then I started doing P90X and all that kind of stuff and lost like 80 pounds and was looking pretty fit and trim. And I had a YouTube channel, and I would post my workout, you know, my progress videos on there. And then one day we decided to do something a little bit different. And one of the things that this man showed us how to do, because like, remember I said earlier, he knew all kind of tricks. Them old timers knew how to do some stuff, man, and so much of it has been forgotten. Um, but in March of 2012, I uploaded first to my other channel and then decided, you know what, we need to create a new channel just for what we do here at Alderman Farms. And so I created this, uh, a, an Alderman Farms YouTube channel and uploaded the video of how to set a corner post with no concrete. I don't know if you can see, but since March... 2012, we now have 5,775 subscribers and our videos have been seen 1,107,338 times. Wow. Mostly because, let me, uh, I should have had this pulled up. Mostly because of this video. I'm going to put it on silent. Yeah, I've got ads on my videos. Guess what? I, I make... Uh, I sure do, and I'm, I make almost, you know, sometimes in the neighborhood of $200 a month from people clicking on ads. I'm trying to make it go away. I guess it's one of them, because it's not good to show your own, to click on your own ads. 
Uh, no, it's really not. If you do it a lot, they'll hammer you, you know. And so I, I always try to skip, make it go away. But sometimes some of these ads. So anyway, I broke all the YouTube rules with this video. I didn't know there were YouTube rules. I mean, not rules, but guidelines. It's too long. It's 11 minutes. It's got all these long title slides at the beginning. Nobody wants those. <laughs> and uh, so, but still, can you see down in the bottom right? This video has been seen by itself 200, almost a quarter of a million times. I've gotten emails. We have subscribers. The last time I checked, I haven't checked in a while, but the last time I checked, our subscribers can be found in 110 countries from all over the globe. I've gotten emails from 20 or more different countries thanking me for this video. I had an email one time that almost brought me to tears from somebody in Thailand who, by the tone of their words, it seemed as if they were crying, saying, Sir, you have no idea what you've done for the people of Thailand. That there are thousands of people who live in rural areas who have no access to concrete or cement. And so they would love to, have, to be able to contain livestock, but they don't know how to do fence. Now they do because of your video. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And it's, I, I wish Mr. Stump was still alive so that he would know that and I could tell him how far and wide his, his uh, little tips have gone. Uh, there's other little tips on, on the YouTube channel that, that come from him. Um, there's a funny thing about this video. I, I'll try to point it out when it gets to a spot where you can see it. The, there's, there's one feature of this video that gets more, there it is, that gets more attention than anything else, including the tip. You see, you see this? Watch right there. <laughs> Can anybody tell what that is? Any guesses? A raccoon? No. No, it's not a possum. A dog. It's a dog. <laughs> that little dog. That little dog has got more comments than the actual method. And this, I don't know how many comments there are, but hundreds of comments. Is that a dog hanging on the fence? <laughs> Why is that dog hanging on the fence? What do you have with a dog hanging on the fence? And I keep wanting to say, people, read the comments. I've answered this question 50-something times, but... You know, they don't know, so I answer it again. That little dog, was, her name was Little Bit. And in that video, she was 18 years old, completely deaf and blind, a little chihuahua. And she had become completely dependent on me. And the only time she felt at peace or calm was when she knew I was near her. So... My wife had made that little camouflage shoulder sling bag for the kids to go squirrel hunting with or something. And it was perfect. I, I, I kept her in that little bag around my neck all day long, you know, just walking around, and, you know, so she could tell that, I was, that she was near me. And if she, if she ever lost me, she would, she would howl, and it just sounded like something from a horror movie because she was deaf at this time, and so she didn't know, couldn't understand the sound she was making, so it just, it was, I would try to recreate it, but y'all would all jump out the window. I mean, it was like, you know, it, it was spooky feeling. And so I had her around my neck when I went out there to start to do this video, but when I'm doing the post hole digging, you know, she's, <laughs> and I said, oh, I, this is going to hurt her. So I looked around and I saw this, so I hung her up on the fence. And between shots, I would walk over to her and pet her and love on her so she would know I was close to her. And I thought she was out of the frame. I thought she was, I didn't realize she could be seen until I had already started editing the video and it was like, too late now. But anyway, that's just a little funny sidebar that that, I promise you, more comments have come in in 240,000 views about, I got some this morning. I put that video up in 2012. I got comments this morning. What is that on the fence? <laughs> you know, so anyway. Um, so we decided to, you know, when we did this video, we thought, well, you know, let's put some, let's do that. 
let's make some videos. And so we did that one. I did a couple of uh, a couple of more fence related videos. Uh, Mr. Stump, Mr. Stump showed me how to take a two two by fours and where you can bolt them together at the end of a piece of fence to have something to grab a hold to with chain and hook it to your tractor so you can pull a fence tight um, evenly. You know, just a homemade device. So we did that, did several. And uh, then YouTube came out with this YouTube partner program where you could let them put ads on your thing and uh, on your videos and you could make a few pennies, you know, every time somebody did something. And um, we, at that time, YouTube has changed the way that they report their analytics and 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 their and your earnings. But uh, so I can't do what I'm about to describe anymore. But back then, you could. I had an app on my phone where I could. I mean, just almost real time, you could see what was happening on your YouTube channel. And this was in uh, in April of uh, when was your that cheer competition? Was it 13? Must have been 13. April of 13. It wasn't last year. Yeah, yeah. In April, April of 2013, Carly Ann was uh, uh, doing competitive cheer at the uh, Gym of Dreams, and and she was at her final competition in Destin. And uh, I was, you know, I'm checking my stats as I normally do, and um, all of a sudden there was like a, a a sort of a out of the ordinary spike in the number of views and clicks that I was getting. And I thought, well, that's weird. But I didn't think that much of it. A couple hours later, I checked it, and it was huge. I mean, it was like I was getting like 20,000 views that day when at that time we were getting 20,000 views a month. And, um, and, and every time I checked it, it just kept going up, going up, going up. So initially I was excited, but then it freaked me out because I thought somebody is click bombing me. I mentioned earlier, you're not supposed to click your own ads, you know, and, uh, and stuff. And uh, there used to be, there, for a time, there was a thing where people would, for some reason, decide they wanted to hurt you, your channel or whatever, and they could deploy these little click bots, these little um, malicious programs that would make it look like you were clicking on your own ads a bunch of times, you know. So I got real nervous about that fired off an email to Google, hey, it ain't me, blah, 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 you know, and uh, unbelievably, they emailed me back, thank you for your concern, we know it's not you, you know, uh, we have ways to tell when that kind of stuff is happening, and uh, you're, you know, you'll be fine, we'll look into it, and so next day, same thing, boom, and so this happened for a couple of three days, and I was talking to a friend of mine about it, and he said, boy, I'd like, to, it'd be interesting to see where those clicks are coming from, how people got to you from, you know, and YouTube Analytics has always been two or three days behind, so it was going to be like Wednesday before I could find out what happened, before I could analyze what had happened that weekend. And so I did. <laughs> and what had happened was it wasn't malicious at all. This was the time of the, this was shortly after the Boston Marathon bombing event. And somebody had uploaded a seven second long video clip of an FBI agent, allegedly an FBI agent, struggling to climb over this complicated look at gate with prongs on it at the top and everything. So you can imagine how careful he was being, crawling over that tall gate. And so he got over it and when his feet hit the ground and he started walking, the gate swung open. <laughs> Sounds like something I would do, you know? So that was, that's why it was funny because the gate was unlocked the whole time and he was struggling to get over it. But it was seven seconds long. And whoever this person was that uploaded that clip called it FBI fence jump. And so what happened was it, that thing went viral. That thing got viewed, uh, I think that subsequently it made it to 9 million, but 7 million of those happened that weekend, that weekend that we were in Destin. And because she titled it FBI fence jump, you know how... Who watches YouTube? Who spends time on YouTube? Anybody? You know, what happens when you get through watching a video? And there's another one about the same topic. It shows you suggested videos, right? Based on some similarity to what you're watching. So what had happened was 7 million people watched this 7 second clip called FBI Fence Jump and my fencing videos got shown to them at the end of it 
as suggested videos. And so 70, 80, 100,000 of them, which is only a small percentage of 7 million people, right? That's a tiny little fraction of them. But they watched my videos and, and, and 70,000 of them clicked something. So I made $600 that weekend <laughs> because somebody uploaded that little thing, you know. It tapered off since then. But, you know, unfortunately, I wish that would happen all the time. But who, you can't ever, if, ever, if you knew how to make things viral, we would all make things viral and sit at home and in our slippers and, and make YouTube videos. It uh, doesn't work like that. So, um, so we've got our YouTube channel. We've got, of course, our website. You saw the picture of Mr. Stump. That was on our, that was on our website. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Everything's Alderman Farms, facebook.com slash Alderman Farms. Well, we have a Twitter account. Can you just ever get enough of a baby pig? Is that not unbelievable? We have Instagram at Alderman Farms. We've got Pinterest. And the most recent addition is we now have a podcast on iTunes called Alderman Farms Radio. Um, this audio that I have on this iPad is going to not only be synced with the video on my iPhone to be a video upload to YouTube later, but I'm also going to take this audio and make it into a podcast um, to have so that people can find out a little bit about the history of Alderman Farms and how we got to where we are. So, all this social media stuff ties into the most recent developments at Alderman Farms, which is our process of becoming commercial, if, if you will. Most of our experience since the late 90s has been homesteaders, right? We've been, we've raised food for ourselves and milk for ourselves and eggs for ourselves. And every now and then we'd sell a little bit here or there um, to help offset the cost of feed. But there's something happening in the world of food consumers out there. There are more and more and more people who are beginning to think, where does my food come from? And, I, and, and they're beginning to care about where their food comes from. They're beginning to care about the quality of food that they put into their bodies. There's a growing number of people who, while they don't mind eating meat, they want to know that the meat that they're eating came from an animal who, who lived well, who lived on a farm where people cared for it and loved it and didn't pump it full of antibiotics and hormones and um, you know we, we raise American guinea hogs that they want to know that the pork they're eating didn't didn't come from a pig who's been in a tiny concrete enclosure its whole life you know having to lay down in its own poop and things of that nature and so um, they want to know the same thing about chickens that they that, that, that the chickens they eat lived outdoors and got to breathe the fresh air instead of the horrible ammonia smell that they would live if they lived in a tiny little cage their whole life. Uh, same with eggs and so forth and so on. There's more and more people who are thinking like that. And so as we were just, I promise, we didn't really start YouTube or our uh, Facebook or anything like that as a marketing effort. It just started as a way to share our life. Um, because there's also a lot of people out there who are just interested in the type of life that we live. For whatever reason, they can't live it, but they would love to, and so they kind of live it through us and others like us. We have lots of friends who do the, do the same sort of thing on, on YouTube. And, but, it's, so it's brought us exposure, and people have found us. Remember I, that group of people I described who are caring more and more about what they eat and things? Some of those people started finding us and saying, hey, what do you have for sale? Um, and so it has developed into a marketing arm, uh, a marketing effort for the products that we currently have available and are building toward having. Now, maybe I should have said this at the beginning. 
Uh, I almost didn't on purpose, but I still have full-time employment. I work for a wonderful company that produces, that develops public safety software, the type of software that runs a 911 center, for example, uh, law enforcement records management, uh, jail management software, and things like that. And so most of what happens at the farm is thanks to Corey. Yay. Yay, Corey. Raise your hand, Corey. That's Corey. Uh, and Patty and our grandson, Tomas, who helps a lot, and Carly Ann pitches in. Because uh, a lot of times, now luckily I work at home, so I do have some free time during, you know, in the mornings and during my lunch break and after work hours. And um, if in an emergency, even during work hours, I can run out and handle some things. Um, but our dream for the longest time was to get the farm into a position to where it could become profitable so that when I get ready to retire from my current uh, employment, we could do that. Uh, but Corey, in the last couple of years, has expressed an interest in, in running the farm. So we've kind of shifted our focus to, from, away from uh, making it successful j for, just for Patty and I to getting the farm to a place to where Corey can take it over. Perfectly timed sound effects. <laughs> so that Corey can take it over. And so that's what we're working toward. We've developed a relationship uh, with, or in the process of developing a relationship with uh, Chef Nick Wallace uh, of Jackson, Mississippi. And if I can figure out how to get that to go down again, let's see, click that. It ain't working. Oh, well, I can't get to my thing. I had a picture of Nick. But um, Nick Wallace is a, a chef in Jackson that... Um, he's the executive chef at the Palette Cafe in, uh, inside the Mississippi Museum of Art. And a, a couple weeks ago, he featured our American guinea hog uh, on his menu for a, a weekend. He's opening up a new restaurant inside the old federal courthouse building, which is going to be really fine. They're going to keep a lot of the decor in there. Um, and he's going to do a lot of... Who, who's, have you ever heard the term farm to table? He's going to be featuring a lot of farm-to-table meals, um, meaning straight from the people who produce it to the, to the menu, uh, instead of going through middle people and making sure he's not getting vegetables shipped from California. He wants to get vegetables picked up and brought to the restaurant from, from right there. Um, he's told us he'll buy every guinea hog we can put on the ground. He's told uh, Patty that he'll buy all the vegetables that we can produce. Um, I just uploaded a video the day before yesterday showing where we intend to expand our garden. We, so now uh, we've had two sizable garden areas for personal use, but we just expanded one of them about 8,000 square feet. Um, so it's now about 130 feet one way and about... 80 or something feet the other way, um, which is, it's a lot. And we started working in there, uh, getting it ready the other day, and Patty and I both just kind of looked at it and went, Whew. you know, that's going to be some, it's going to be some work, you know, but hey, it's work. Um, but money can be made, if, and, and we hope to play it right. We went to a class and a conference in Mobile a couple months ago, and there was a lady there from, um, up around, she had a farm up close to Washington, D.C., and they sold nothing but vegetables. Now, I want you to listen to this. Get the math of this. She has 24 acres, I think, and, but she's only farming 10 to 12 of them at a time. She farms half of them one year, and when she's farming that half, the other half is resting, letting the ground rest, or she has it planted in cover crops or something to help rebuild the soil. So she's only farming 10 to 12 acres, nothing but vegetables. She's not selling big ticket items like livestock. She's selling vegetables. She's selling them. Anybody know what a CSA is? You ever heard of a CSA? It's called Community Supported Agriculture, where if you've got a local farmer, you can, at the beginning of the season, pay that local farmer 250 bucks, for example. I'm just pulling that number out of the air. 
to help, and you pay it up front to help them offset the cost of seeds or whatnot. And so for whatever period that CSA is operating, you get a box of vegetables every week for, what, for again, for whatever period is covered. So she does CSA, she does farmer's markets. Y'all know what farmer's markets are. She sells to some restaurants. And she showed us her numbers for one, for I think 2012. I may be wrong about that, but I think it was 2012. In, in, in whatever year she showed us, her, y'all know the difference between gross revenue and net revenue and all that? Her gross revenue off of 10 to 12 acres for that one year was 400 and something thousand dollars. That was her gross revenue. That means that was the total amount of money that they brought in. But then she had her expenses to go against that, right? So she had to pay all her people, herself and, and everybody, and buy equipment and buy the seeds and all that kind of stuff, and still had money left over at the end. Now, now she made more money than, than we could possibly make because of where she was. The, the, the area that she was in demanded high prices. But who would take half of that? <laughs> Anybody? Who would, who would take a third of it or, or a fourth of it, you know? I'll get my fingers dirty. Yeah, you get, that's worth getting your fingers dirty over, yeah. isn't it? And, and what, a, what a better feeling to know that you made that money providing healthy food for your family and for other people. Um, so that's where we're heading. That's where we are uh, right now. We're getting, getting geared up for this year's farmer's market in Brookhaven. We, we may actually have to uh, expand and go to some other farmer's markets. We have a, a guinea hog at the processor right now in Atala County um, because we got our labels approved to sell our pasture-raised pork in retail packaging, you can buy Alderman Farms pork chops, you know, Alderman Farms ground pork and whatnot. And we've got our first guinea hog at the processor to be able to see how that, how that marketing goes. Can you buy it at the Piggly Wiggly? No, you can't buy it at the Piggly Wiggly. Uh, you, as of, you know, whenever we get it, in fact, we've got to go this week to pick it up. And you'll either be able to buy it from our farm or at the Brookhaven Farmer's Market now and um, we have to it'll be a while before we can take some others up there uh, don't get me started on guinea hogs because I'll I'll be here till Wednesday sometime talking about my pigs I love my pigs but there's the one of the reasons we have them they're slow growing they're not like the commercial type hogs that you that you most know about nowadays where in six months they weigh 220 pounds it takes two years to get one of these to 200 pounds, and so they, you normally process them at about 100 pounds at a, about a year. And uh, so it's less meat, but man, make you want to slap somebody. It's, <laughs> it's good. And, you, and you, you also don't have to feed them. The only time we have to feed these is when I have them confined for some reason. We confine the mamas when they're about to have a baby. And when I say confined, I mean in a, it's still in a, an area bigger than this room. Uh, I don't mean in a cage but just to protect her and, and the babies from any predators. We lost a bunch of babies out of our first batch to crows, believe it or not. Uh, crows, they're, uh, they're assassins. I had no idea. Um, I thought it was our dogs, and I almost did some bad things to our dogs and, and come to find out it was crows. But when they're confined, or if we have them confined to a small area to train them to electric fence, then I have to feed them. But if they've got access to the property where they can go and feed themselves on grass and, and whatnot, they don't have to be fed. In fact, if you feed them, you run the risk of overfeeding them. Um, so that's kind of our journey, you know, from uh, living in a small subdivision in Baker, Louisiana as a cop with an English degree to YouTube sensation <laughs> and, uh, and, and budding farmers. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? Dr. Langston, I didn't bring my paper up here. I wanted to bring my paper to make sure I covered what you, did I miss anything? No, I, I, I got everything I wanted. Good. I heard the whole story. And, uh, he says, I got everything I wanted plus about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have ever milked a goat or a cow? Anybody? Good. Good. 
How many chickens do we have? One cat and a dog. Yeah, I don't know. The number, well, the numbers on cats and chickens are, don't hold me to it. I don't know how many cats. At one time we had 20 something, but we have no mice. Uh, <laughs> let's see, we have 60 something Rhode Island red laying hens now. That's a rough estimate. And Patty's going to be watching this thing. No, that's not right. Uh, Patty's the one that handles the numbers. She's the math whiz. I'm the English guy. I'm the guy that can write 10,000 words, but I have to count on my fingers and still get it wrong. Um, but Patty knows all the details on the numbers, but I think 60-something, we may have less than that now. Uh, we've got uh, about a dozen black Australarp uh, hens. We've decided to go with Rhode Island Reds and black Australarps, mainly because they're easy to tell apart. And, and the, what we plan to do eventually it's build mobile laying houses. I don't know if you, if you guys, any of the, probably not any of the youngsters, but anybody know who Joel Salatin is? Look up Joel Salatin, S-A-L-A-T-I-N. Uh, he's like the godfather of sustainable agriculture. But S-A-L-A, what? T-I-N, Polyface Farms. Um, he's in Virginia. But, and he may not have been the first to do this, but he's the one that made it popular where you build these portable laying houses on wheels and, you, and you, you keep your chickens in in an area, say a quarter an acre or whatever, uh, with this electrified poultry netting that we just absolutely love. And uh, it doesn't hurt them, they stay away from it. And, and you move them a, around the pasture and it helps fertilize the pasture and they get fresh grass and insects or whatever. Well, once we put all our chickens out there, Every so often, we're going to need to know who's old and who needs to be replaced. And so we're, we're setting up an alternating uh, stock rotation of red chickens and black chickens. <laughs> so we'll know, you know, the, you know this year the old, the old ones are the red ones, you know, and then when we, okay, this year the old ones are the black ones, and we'll know which to do. And um, we've got 180 eggs in the incubator right now, as we talked about earlier. Uh, I think 160 of those are Rhode Island Reds. These are mostly for sale, and uh, people want Rhode Island Reds for some reason. And uh, No, 120 are Rhode Island Reds. 60 of them are black Australarp. We still have a few mixed breed hens. We've got guinea hogs right now. I've got 17 uh, pigs on the ground, two sows. A sow is a female pig who has had babies. I've got two uh, nine-month-old gilts, G-I-L-T-S, which is a female pig that has not had babies. Um, I've got one, the, the boar that's the daddy of all the babies uh, will be in an ice chest next, this week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's, uh, he's been packaged at, uh, at Atala County. And I've got one young boar that, uh, that I don't want to, to breed the sows. And then we've got 12 babies uh, between, uh, well, some of them were born on Christmas Eve and some of them were born January 24th, one month later. So again, I don't do math. So however old that makes them, that's how old they are from, since Christmas in January to now. Um, so I'm in... I, I'm in the market. Yes, ma'am. So you said that this particular breed of um, pig, it, 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 uh, it takes a long time for it to, to grow up and, and mm -hmm. be large enough for, to be ready to, scent for, to be sent for processing. Right. Um, long enough for you to get to know them. Oh, absolutely. And um, does it um, hurt your feelings when you have to send them off for processing? Yep. It sure does. I'm fixing to show you what they look like. Yeah, we, uh, that's them as babies. There's nothing cuter than a baby pig. I used to think there was nothing cuter than a baby goat. I was wrong. There's nothing cuter than a baby pig. Yeah, it's, um, it's a somber day, you know. I mean, we, we, we butchered one ourself, ourselves um, a few months ago, and it was difficult. I mean, it, it, I don't mind. I'm not ashamed to say I had to go lay down after, you know, uh, because I love these pigs, and we spend time with them, and we, we love on them, and it's our job to give them the best life that, that they can have, the most stress-free life. And so 
you know, it's, it's difficult. But, but what I do is I take comfort in knowing that they've had a great life, you know, that, that we've loved them and I can look out there and see them laying in the mud and remind me to talk about mud in a minute. That's because I want y'all to know why they do that. So, yeah, it's, you know, but it is what it is. I mean, it's, uh, those pigs, our, our job is to give them the best life possible, and in return, they provide my family and others with an incredible product, you know. And so when we got ready to slaughter that pig on our farm, I mean, I prayed. I prayed, Lord, let my shot be true, you know, because I, I wanted that little pig, I wanted that pig to go down and be dead. I didn't want that little pig to suffer. And God answered that prayer in one shot, and he crumbled, and I knew. He, you know, he was gone. He never knew what happened. And so then, after that, I had to remind myself, he don't care what I'm doing. You know, when I had to process his carcass, he was gone, you know. So um, it wasn't a fun thing to do. And when, like I said, when we got through, I had to go take a nap because it just was emotionally draining. Um, it bothers me. You've heard me say Atala a few times that our pig is at a processing facility in Atala County. That's two and a half hours from my house. It bothers me that I have to make my pigs ride in a trailer for two and a half hours to the nearest facility. But we have to because that's the nearest. Uh, it may be the only in the state. Patty thinks it's the nearest. I think it may be the only that has a state inspector on site. Because in order to sell pork retail, your pork has to be processed in a facility with a state inspector on site. They have to be there when your hog is being processed. So I don't have a choice if we want it. But, I, but it bothers, that bothers me because they don't like that. It scares them to death. So for two and a half, because they don't ride in trailers every day, you know. And um, so they don't know what's going on. And I don't like that. It bothers me. But it is what it is, you know. And, and we had, so I'm hoping maybe that uh, as things, as more, that crowd of people I was describing earlier who cares about their food, as those numbers continue, I'm hoping some entrepreneur will decide it's worth it to build a solar facility closer. And we hear rumors there may be one in, coming in Jackson, and that would be a whole lot better. Um, mud, and again, y'all just tell me when to stop. We, cause what about we, uh, lamb? Any idea about going towards veal? We, we've, uh, that's not, no, veal is not lamb. Veal, okay. veal is a calf. Okay. And uh, I don't want to talk about veal. I don't like, I don't right. like, no, I don't like how you get to, ve you know, veal. Mutton. Yeah. The mutton. mutton yeah. Mutton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there are some discussions. Um, we're waiting right now. We have applied through the national, national NRCS, national something other. <laughs> That's that's horrible. I hope the NRCS, if you're watching this, forgive me that I, I can't remember what your initials are. But uh, they give out grants, and you know, and we've applied to them for some fencing, perimeter fencing, and some other things to to get into meat goat production. Um, we're still undecided whether we're going to do a Nubian is the type of dairy goat we prefer, and boar is a common meat goat uh, breed. And we've been considering a Nubian boar cross um, for better milk so the babies will grow, but wife's looking into something else. But we have thought about, but I'm going to tell you something. Sheep are a whole nother thing. I mean, they're a whole nother critter. And they, there's a problem. They have, I think it's copper that they can't have too much of. And so when we buy these supplemental mineral tubs for our goats and, and cows and stuff, sheep can't have that. So that's things we have to consider, that if we decide to get into sheep, they will have to be segregated from everybody. See, right now, our, we only have two cows, two Jersey milk cows that we breed every year to an Angus bull, which is a meat bull, and we raise up and sell their offspring. But our cows, our goats, and our pigs all run together. They're one big happy family. We couldn't do that with sheep because some of the things that we supplement our animals with, sheep can't have. Mud, right quick, I was going to tell you about mud. Anybody know why pigs get in the mud? That's one reason. Because they get sun. She said because they get sunburned. Is it because they're nasty? No, of course not. 
Listen, pigs are not nasty. They now they're dirty. Who knows that there's a difference between dirty and nasty? Um, listen, if you're raising hogs, if you're raising a hundred hogs in a room this big with concrete on the floor, are those pigs going to be nasty? You bet. Where are they going to go to the bathroom? Wherever they are, right? Because when you got to go, you got to go. But if pigs have the opportunity to be outdoors, they don't poop where they sleep. They don't poop where they eat. They walk away and go do their business elsewhere. But here's the thing about pigs and mud and water. Pigs don't sweat. Pigs don't... How does a dog get rid of body heat? <laughs> That's what they're doing when a dog is panting or any other animals that pant. They're displacing heat through their tongue and their breath. They're, they're lowering their body heat. Um, pigs can't do that. So pigs, the only way pigs can lower their body temperature is through a process called conduction. Anybody heard of the term conduction? It's basically transferring heat to a cooler surface. So they look for water and mud, a cooler surface, to cool themselves down. So they'll lay down in it, and you'll see them lay there, and then they'll flip over. And they're, they're transferring their body heat into the cooler surface. That's the primary reason. Another reason is, is for sunscreen, especially light-colored pigs. They'll coat their bodies with mud because if you've got a really light-colored pig, they'll get blistered, won't they, Carly Ann? We had... We had one with a, a white strap on its back, and that sucker got out there and was color of your dress almost, you know, just just pink. We actually put aloe on it and sunscreen and everything. We looked stupid. <laughs> Whoever thought of painting a, a pig with sunscreen, but that's what we did. And there's a, there's one other reason too, and that's as an insect repellent. You know, if they coat themselves with uh, with mud, the insects can't get to them and bite them. Um, but anyway, I just I don't want you to think pigs play in the mud because they're just nasty. They're not nasty. They're cooling themselves, protecting themselves from the sun and insects. So really the sky's the limit on diversity. Even with the livestock that you have now, for instance, with your goats, meat, cheese, ice cream. Oh, what? Yeah. 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 Patty made, Patty's making cheese right now, even as we speak from... And she's making ice cream. I'm glad you mentioned diversity. Yes. Listen, if you go back, all of our, how many of you, your grandparents or, or what, had a farm? Or anybody? Most people, maybe some of you are young enough that maybe it was your great grandparents, but I'm telling you, somebody in your family tree farmed. You know, they, they grew things. Um, there was no such thing back in those days as a chicken farm. There was no such thing back in those days as a uh, pig farm. And there may have been a cattle farm. That was called a ranch. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that, that for years people have grown big herds of cattle. But what there were were farms. And every farm had chickens, maybe a goat, had a few pigs, had vegetables, or whatnot, and they all ran together. A milk cow. And a milk cow. That's right. They, they had diverse farming operations. They may not have called it an operation. But it was better for the animals. It was better for the earth. It was better all around. Look, when our chickens, when we put our chickens out we, we, uh, in a new area in the pasture, I know this is going to sound gross, but bear with me. What's the first thing they find? You know, our cows have been there, right? And the first thing they go to is the cow patties. Now, look, they're not eating poop, right? They're going through it, though, and picking out the parts that didn't get digested. I know that's a little gross, okay? Yeah. But let me tell you, but what else are they doing when they're Do going through? Do gold in that? Do what now? There's literally gold. They're getting ready to process manure for gold. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Corey, make a note of that. <laughs> Get your shovel and make a note of that. But, but what else are they doing, those chickens doing, when they're going through that poop looking for little bits of whatever? They're spreading fertilizer. They're spreading that manure. 
So we don't have, you can go around, and listen, pigs do that too. They'll, they'll find a fresh cow patty and go through there and pick out the good bits. Now, it, it blows my mind to think they have to do that with their nose. But they do. But you don't see very many cow patties on our property because they've been spread. Um, and that's the way it used to be in the old days. It, they, you'd run these animals behind each other, and they had a sim. Here's your, here's your $4 word for the day. They had a symbiotic relationship. That'll be your homework assignment. Look up what the word symbiotic means and write a 500-word essay. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. But look it up. Look it up. Look up the word symbiotic. They had a symbiotic relationship. Basically, the short version is they, everybody benefits. They all they had they shared their benefits with each other, um, and there were less diseases on farms and and whatnot. By the way, who who saw on the news or I know maybe some of the teachers have. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen anything about it lately, but this deadly pig virus that's killed millions of piglets or thousands of piglets around the United States. Anybody heard anything about that? where they get this horrible case of diarrhea and, and get dehydrated and die real quick. Yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. Am I worried about it? Not one bit. You know why? That happens to pigs who live in confinement, who live in these close quarters like that. My pigs live in the out, great outdoors. They don't, I'm not worried about that in the least. The only, reason, the only way I'd be worried about it is if a farmer who had it came to my house. And then I'd, I would meet him at the door with a gallon of Clorox and say, bathe in this. Then you can come to my, you know, pour, take your shoes off. And I'm going to stick these shoes in this Clorox. That would be about the only way I'd worry about it. Because we have an almost closed system at our, at our house. We, we raise our own chicks now. I do have to go buy a new boar every so often to, to eliminate inbreeding. You know, I don't want um, the same boar to breed his, his daughters or things like that. Um, it, can, it can be done, but I, I'd rather not. And uh, so to control that, uh, every, every now and then I might have to bring in some, some new. Um, but you have to be, you be careful, and when we bring him in, we'll quarantine him for a while, keep him away from everybody else, make sure he doesn't have any uh, sickness that he could pass on to mine. Uh, same thing when we get some meat goats or whatnot. I'll have to keep them confined, make sure they're all good to go. Um, before we allow them to engage with anybody else. Yes? So would your product be considered organic? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. We call it, we use a term that Joel Salatin uses, beyond organic. L let me tell you something. Next time, here, and here's a fun little project for you to do. The next time you go to the grocery store, go to the eggs, and look at the different descriptions that they have on the eggs that you can buy. At the highest end, you'll see the most expensive will be certified organic. You'll see some in there say, that say free range. You'll see some that say cage free. Those all mean something. Some say locally produced. Some say locally produced. Some say, you know, all natural. The problem is the the government or whoever gets control of that process and, and in order for you to say organic, you have to be certified organic, which means somebody, some muckety-muck from somewhere has to come and make sure with a little checklist that you're doing all this and not doing this. We've got a problem with certified organic because certified organic allows certain chemicals that we would never put on our stuff. So we call it beyond organic. You know, it's just natural. You know, we, our fertilizer comes out of the barn. Our, our fertilizer comes out of the cows and the pigs and the chickens. We don't, you know, um, but I want you to remember this. When you go to the grocery store and you see free range, when you, when you think of the term free range chicken, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Sending selfies to that old couple on the porch. You know, that's a great Geico commercial. That free range chicken riding, hopping the train with the hobos and sending selfies. He just keeps sending pictures. That's funny. But that's the idea you get from free range, right? It's not what it means, technically. Technically, free range means that there's a, that, that, that chicken has access 
to the outdoors, but there's no guarantee he ever goes. He could be in a big, huge barn with a little door in it that he could go out if he wanted to, but there's no guarantee that he does. When you hear the word cage-free, again, what does that conjure up? You know, conjures up some woman with blonde hair running down the beach, you know, <laughs> with her hair waving, she's cage-free. All that means is that chicken doesn't live in a little individual cage no bigger than this iPad. But it, but it doesn't mean that that chicken doesn't live indoors with a bazillion other chickens in one big, big place. So it doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, so you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. These labels mean something, you know. All natural doesn't really mean all natural. I don't, I don't remember the... I think the that doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't mean anything. So, you know, we call our eggs farm fresh eggs from pastured hens, you know. And eventually... So now a common term you hear is pasture raised, pastured pork. For beef, it's grass fed. But eventually those terms will be co-opted too and somebody will set, set down what they have to mean. But the problem is that in itself is not a bad thing to say what a term has to mean if you use it. But, what, but the unintended consequences are once you say it must mean this, then that's all people worry about. Then, then, then it's kind of shady people get a hold of it and say, okay, well, if it all has to mean this, all it has to mean is this, it don't have to mean any of this anymore. Does that make sense? In other words, free reign. If all it has to mean is they have access to pasture, ah, well, that means all I got to do is cut a door, but they don't ever have to go there. You see what I'm saying? So it, it's, eventually those terms will, will get co-opted too. Any other questions? Tractor or mule? I have a tractor. Uh, I wish I had a mule, you know, but then it, I was just thinking about this yesterday on my tractor yesterday afternoon doing a little plowing, that we want to be as sustainable as possible. A tractor is not sustainable. If, you know, well, it's not ultimately sustainable if, for example, for some reason we had no more access to diesel. Now, we could make our own diesel if we had, access, you know, biodiesel or whatnot, so I guess it's you know, there are ways to get around it. But in our situation, I don't know how sustainable a mule is either because I would have to, I'd have to be able to grow the food that the mule needs to eat. You know, I mean, so there's, there's trade-offs. And, and so right now, we, we, although we're heading towards sustainability and we want to go in that direction, we're more focused on healthy, right? You know, if I can grow healthy food in not as sustainable ways right now, then that's what we're going to do. Because we need to do that right now. That We need to do it. I can't wait until I can create a mulch bed 8,000 square feet and have it ready to plant. I can't do that. So as we, as we have an opportunity to make one thing at a time more sustainable in our efforts, we will do so. Christmas tree. We, we well, we... We sometimes cut a little pine sapling. Sometimes we'll cut a little cypress sapling. Uh, last year we pulled out the plastic one that we have in a box, yeah. you know, and set it there. There are no plans to put in. Oh, uh, to grow them. Grow them. <laughs> that was, for my YouTube fans, that was me not having a clue what he was asking me. <laughs> no, because it takes too much space, you know. I mean, we've got, you know, I said I've got 116 acres. Most of it's still in timber. And um, so that I don't want to cut down. Right. And the, the places that aren't covered with trees, I need that for the handful of critters that need to eat it. Do you have pine trees yeah, that, that, that's right, Corey. Corey but we do have a pine plantation. We've got two areas of, that have young pine trees that, that we will, once they reach maturity, cut them, plant again. You know, we, we cut that whole little area just to plant pine trees back, and so that's that'll be generations of trees go, growing and being harvested. All right, one more question, Tommy, on my end. Green technology, is that a farm term as well? Green technology on the farm? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's, that it is a farm term per se, but um, 
It is green technology, meaning, you know, again, that means something. And it probably, you know, I, I probably couldn't define it for you uh, correctly or inclusively if you had a gun to my head. Solar power. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. My, my sort of limited understanding of green technology would be energy sources that didn't rely on the power company, things of that nature. Uh, we do not have, we, we have a, one solar fence charger out on a back area that we ran some electric wire uh, to give the animals more area um, that we love. And we've talked about for a while adding additional solar capability. I love the idea of it. Um, but here's the thing. When it becomes affordable, people will do it. Um, here's my little soapbox mini rant. The government can't make people do things that they can't afford to do. And when it becomes workable and affordable, people will do it. Uh, if, in, in order for me to make my house solar independent, it would cost $50,000 to do that. I'm sorry. I'm not doing that. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Hey, if it costs $10,000, I just might, you know. Uh, I don't know where that line is, but it's not at 50000 But we've talked about adding solar capabilities to our water well, um, which would obviously cost a lot less, you know, some type of solar backup situation. Um, right now I've got a generator that if, my, if the power goes out, we can still have water. Um, so, you know, I, I wanna, I'd like to solarize my barn, you know, to have certain things out there. So, yeah, we're not... I won't do windmills because they kill birds, <laughs> you know. Um, although killing a few crows, hmm, maybe I do, maybe I do need a windmill. Uh, but uh, anyway, so anything else? Well, we've got we I built Patty a greenhouse. Um, I think I got a video on that. Uh, out of two cattle panels, bent them over to make the roof. So it's like eight feet, and uh, put boards at the bottom to hold them in place and covered them with visqueen. And we're really ramping up this year because I told you about this big, big garden we're doing, but I think she's planting 30-something varieties of tomato plants. Um, we're very successful with yellow squash, uh, very successful with cucumbers. We've got two or three different varieties of cucumbers. She grows a Japanese cucumber that gets about that long. But, and it's, but it's only that big around. It's long and skinny and it's great for pickling. Um, we're growing, we grow snap beans every year. We grow some corn every year. We, of course, we won't be able to grow enough corn to sell, uh, but we grow <laughs> corn for ourselves. Um, what else, Corey? Help me. Peas, okra. Oh, man, we've got some heritage cow horn okra seeds that we got from my brother-in-law in Louisiana that he got from his daddy who had them forever. And this, this okra, I've never seen anything like it. Who, who's grown okra before? And you got to cut it before what? Before it gets big because it gets what? Hard. This stuff, Corey, this stuff can get this long, that big around, and it's still not hard. Now, eventually it does, you know. It's unbelievable, and it just comes and comes and comes and gets 15 feet high. You know, you, we keep clipping it. So we, we love growing okra. Um, I said snap beans, peas. Yeah, we finally start. We, we're starting. We grew some. We planted some berry bushes, blackberry, a couple of raspberries. We're going to be... Blueberries, we're going to be planting some muscadine vines. We've got wild muscadines on the property, but they always seem to be 40 feet in the air, you know, up in a tree. So we're going to build a trellis and grow some muscadines. Um, we're growing, oh, lettuce. Patty grows a number of varieties of leaf lettuce, not head lettuce, you know, just leaf lettuce that you go cut. The, I think romaine is a leaf, isn't it? Uh, we don't grow romaine, but we grow some, I don't think, do we grow romaine? But she's got several colorful varieties, and it's very... I'm looking at adding microgreens, which is basically the little baby plants 
like sunflowers are a popular one. Chefs love them. You grow them indoors in a tray, takes seven days, you know, for a harvest. And you sell them by the pound. And uh, they're high, high in nutrition. But there's going to be some infrastructure that has to be set up to do that. Oh, mushrooms. Uh, uh, inoculated. You don't plant mushrooms. You inoculate something with mushrooms. That's what you call planting. And I, I, I inoculated some logs, drilled some holes in logs, and stuck these little mushroom plugs in there. Uh, that's called inoculating that log with, with some shiitake mushrooms. And we're months away from those producing, but those logs that I inoculated should, once they start producing, should produce for five or six years, which is amazing. So y'all sell at the farmer's market in Brookhaven? Brookhaven Farmer's Market. Okay. And then the other question I wanted to ask is, where are you? Can we come and see you? Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, it's, it's set it up, you know, to make sure that we're going to be there, but we'd love for you to come. We'd love for you to come. We're, we're out on Norman Trail. Yeah, field trip, field trip. Come on, let's go. Now load up. Yeah. No, we'd love for you to come. And, uh, and it's about to, of course, it's fixing to rain again, but gosh, we had so much rain. I, I hate to complain about rain, so Lord, I'm not complaining. But my goodness, it rained so much. And we just were neck deep in mud everywhere you went, you know. But luckily, it's drying out. We got some more rain coming, but it's been enough time that. Um, so yeah, eventually that's. I'm glad you mentioned that because another thing that we want to do, for profit, is agritourism. We want to, uh, because there's lots of people. There were only a handful of hands in here, who who said they had family members who generations ago were farmers. Uh, so other than you folks who raised your hands, who's been to a farm? I live on a farm. Good for you. Whereabouts? Oh, okay. Good. Oh, well, hey, back to Miss Stephanie. So you can forget to tell her I said that. All right, Connie. Yep. I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you have a, a video on the cheese making process? Um, do we have a video on cheese making process? Maybe on. I think we did a, a, a video on her making some ricotta cheese. Yeah. Um, we got. We need to do more. You know, we need to do more. Yeah, it's it. You know, we we need to do that. We've got. Uh, we did a video on. We started out just doing some how-to videos on farming, but it, but it expanded to so much. You know, now I've got playlists of nothing but pigs, playlists of baby goats, playlists of, you know, funny. Yeah, you know, playlists of my grandson Tomas, and it, but but every now and then we we do another how-to. We did a. A video for her biscuit mix, her homemade biscuit mix that's been seen, gosh, hundred thousand times now. Uh, we did a some kind of little spaghetti recipe she put together. We we did that, but we do need to do some more cheese making videos. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, like, uh, you know, Angola, the prison. Uh -huh. They um, actually raise their own stuff. Yeah. That's right. They do. They they. I think a hundred percent. I think they a hundred percent provide. Yeah, yeah, they they do. They, I think I'm I'm pretty sure. In fact, I think they not only raise 100 percent of the food consumed in the prison, but they also have some to sell. I think they make more than they need there. I think they do send it out if they have. Yeah, yeah, it's a big operation, but that's good. I'm glad they do that for those guys for more than one reason. I'm glad the taxpayers don't have to pay feed, pay to feed them, but I'm also glad for the guys who are working the farm because they're learning something that, that they can take with them, you know, when, uh, when they get out of there, they're learning a, a, good, a good life skill. So are you at a point now, if somebody walked up to you on the street and say, what are you, would you say farmer? I will now, now that, now that you said that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that's interesting that you say that, you know, because at what point do you self-identify as a farmer, you know, I mean, yeah. Nobody's ever asked me that, so, you know, uh, I've never had to give it much thought, so thank you for that little bit of self-realization that you helped me, uh, yeah, so, I don't know what I would have said, but uh, I probably would have said, I'm Pawpaw, because, you know, Daddy and Pawpaw are my favorite titles, 
And uh, I don't hear Daddy as much anymore, so Papa has kind of moved up to number one. Okay, so Papa, can anybody in this room become a farmer? Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, I won't go into this whole discussion, but there are, well, what if I don't have any land? Well, there, there are young farmers all over the country who are, by the way, we need young farmers because you know what the average age of a full-time farmer is in this country? Last time I looked, it was 65 or 66. So that doesn't bode well for the future of food production. But the good news is there are lots and lots of young people who are saying, I want to do, you know, I want to raise food. I want to be a farmer. Well, do I have to own land? You know what? No, you don't. Um, there are lots of folks who find other people who have property to, uh, to allow them to use it. In some cases, free of charge, just in return for some of the harvest. In other cases, in return for some tiny little lease amount. In other cases, from a more typical rent amount, you know. But my point is there's ways to make it happen. Uh, if young people want to farm, you can find land, and you don't have to have a bunch. You know, I told you what that lady made on 10 acres, uh, farming 10 acres. You told us her growth. You can tell us what that. Well, I didn't know. I, don't, I can't remember her. I, well, her net was, and don't go, well, there you go. Let me explain. <laughs> Let me explain the net, okay? She grows 400-something thousand. After all of her expenses, she had 20-something thousand left. Oh, that ain't nothing. Yeah, but let me, tell, let me explain to you that in her expenses, that is all everybody's salary. That's everybody's benefits, including her. That was one of the things she was preaching, is that when a farmer tells you they're making money, ask them if they're, if they're paying themselves. Because a lot of times they're not. A lot of times farmers won't factor in payment for themselves. And, and so this lady paid a couple sixty-something thousand dollars a year plus benefits to manage her farm. She paid herself somewhere in the neighborhood of forty grand, but she, but she also did some teaching. So uh, she played, paid all of her seasonal employees plus benefits, plus paid all the equipment, plus you know everything. You see what I'm saying? That twenty thousand at the end was gravy. gravy. It was cash money. That wasn't money she had to, oh, well, well, she made 400 but she had to live off of 20 No, no, no. She had 20 left over after she lived, you know, after they did everything. She had 20 left over. She said sometimes what they do is they'll buy some little special piece of equipment that they don't really need, but they've always wanted. Or sometimes she'll just divide it up among the, uh, her employees, you know, give it as a bonus or something. So I don't really know what her typical net was, you know, right. but, but it was 400 grand with 20 left over after yeah. everything, yeah. including 401ks, was funded, you know. So it, it can be done. There are people making a good, microgreens is a good way to start. You can start with a little bitty greenhouse, raising microgreens, get you a relationship with a local chef somewhere. And uh, I listened to a podcast of a guy one time making $2,000 a, a week selling microgreens. And it's work. you got to be there. But you can do it. But pay attention to your studies. you got to be able to communicate. Communication is key. you got to be able to communicate. Um, as you can tell by now, I have no trouble talking. I have more trouble stopping than I, than I have talking. But you have to be able to communicate. To people. You've got to be able to communicate passion. You've got to be able to smile and um, make somebody laugh every now and then, but you've got to be able to communicate your vision and communicate your passion, but uh, you can do it. So we were going to do, uh, you know, take a trip to your farm, but we just threw samples in your product. <laughs> probably some, I'll probably, uh, probably give you some milk, uh, and, and we may have, I, I don't know if what, how much pork I got in the freezer, but if I got some, we'll cook up some little with toothpicks in them, you know, like in Win Dixie, like this, you know. But yeah, we'll let you we'll let you taste the milk, for sure. Uh, it just depends on what I got on hand. But yeah, seriously, that I'm I, you know, let's talk about that sometime. Maybe y'all coming down, I'd love it.
Yeah, yeah, we do raise bees. Uh, we have beehives, and we we plan. We've got three beehives now, and we plan on expanding up to at least ten sometime. Not sure when. Um, there's money. There's money and honey. I don't want any wasps. I don't want any wasps. We were the, the first time we we robbed our beehives. First time we collected some honey from them. We we uh, waited too late and we didn't want to take it all. We wanted to make sure they had enough to get over the winter because that's what the bees live on over the winter. So we only took five frames. You know, not a super is the box that the frames are in. So we only took five frames out of the three houses, the three hives combined. And off of those five frames, we collected almost seven quarts of honey. That blew my mind. I had no idea that, that you could get that much. I should have known, but we've got some bee videos uh, on our YouTube channel. So, but we will be expanding, if for nothing else, just for personal use, because we love honey. We, I, we sweeten our coffee with honey. Patty cooks with honey. If we can use honey in place of sugar, we do. Ice cream, yeah. Well, believe it or not, we have to cover science, social studies, uh, reading, writing, and math. And I think one way or another, we got it all in here today. <laughs> <laughs> we did it all. Absolutely. Science, everything. Yeah. Even math, although maybe we should get your wife to come. Yeah, you should get Patty to come. <laughs> Patty, you need to come do the math, dear. Okay. They're, they're asking me about math. <laughs> so. You're very welcome. Yeah, Thanks. We